everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Appraisal Buzzcast. We appreciate all the support. With me, as always, is our host, Hal Humphreys. Hal, welcome in. Good morning, Jim. How are you today? I'm doing great. We have a great interview today with Steve Payton, uh, Pappen. Uh, let me bring him in. Hello, gentlemen. Hi, Steve. How are you today? I am doing just great. How about you guys? Doing fantastic. Um, you. you know, I kind of want to dive right in. So we did a couple of special updates from the appraisal buzz when when the Rapatoni crash first happened. We um, delivered some messaging um, that was in line with what Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were saying that appraisers needed to consider uh, with the lack of information. Um, but before we go into that, you know, I know you've been a friend of the appraisal buzz pretty much from day one, um, but you haven't been on in quite some time. So for the listeners that aren't familiar with, with Steve Pappen, just tell us kind of how you got back into this appraisal world. Well, that's a highly personal thing that I'll comment on. I went through some uh, very major family transitions. Um, so I have uh, a total of 12 articles that have been published nationally between the magazines. Uh, and that was the relationship uh, that Joan Trice originally challenged me on a point. When I challenged her on a point, she said, well, write something. So that's how that journey started. But my wife became ill in uh, 2015 to 2019 was a blank. Um, and then my daughter-in-law became ill. So uh, up until a few months ago, about a year ago, she began to recover. Uh, so now I'm back. So to those uh, who appreciate my perspective, I feel great to be back and be engaged in the industry. Uh, compliments to the summit. Um, and that was a great event. Uh, we do a one day event in, in Ohio, which I have run in the past house. So I'm humbled by how well that went. It's a lot to do. But I've reentered the space, been active uh, you know, more in the professional world for about a year and a half, two years now, and, and really enjoy being back. Well, it's good to have you back. I'm going to take a real quick moment and give a shout out to one of our sponsors, and then we'll come back and dive right into this topic. Did you know that NAN hosts quarterly discussions with our appraisal panel on bias, inclusion, equity, and diversity initiatives that impact the appraisal industry? The topic of bias in the appraisal world will remain at the forefront of legislative, agency, and lender priorities well into the future. At NAN, we believe that intentional bias is only a very small fraction of the underlying issue and that outdated policies and regulations and unconscious bias are a far greater concern. It's our hope to work closely with the appraiser community as partners in an endeavor to improve processes and procedures and ensure equitable treatment for all valuations. Learn more by visiting nan-amc.com. Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to The Appraisal Buzz. I'm Hal Humphreys, and I've got Steve Pappen uh, joining me today. And we're going to be talking a little bit about the Rapitoni, um hack, um, which effectively works into uh, what, what, Steve, you called a few minutes ago an information crisis. Um, now, we all at this point kind of know what happened with the hack, but you're out of Cincinnati and you guys had a particularly bad impact from that. Can you tell us a little of the story of what happened uh, from the start when you first realized it wasn't working? I can. I think every appraiser in the country can imagine what it would be like to sit down at your computer and have your MLS service not available. We all had that moment, right? Uh, well, we over the course of a day or so began to realize it was not going to be available again in the foreseeable future. Um, so uh, it's a it's immediately a crisis. Um, and crisis management is a part of what this story is about. What do appraiser leadership do with the coalitions and the other movements or just people in their local markets who do leadership? What do you do in a crisis situation? It is something appraisers rely on somebody to take charge and try to solve problems. Uh, but what's different about Cincinnati's situation is in 2021, we began to look for an alternative uh, uh, MLS provider. So in 2022, a new entry into the value into the MLS space called Perchwell uh, was selected as our provider. Um, and is is often the case with technological changes. Uh, they have going to be ready in three months for about a year and a half now, and uh, never quite got there. But it, the um, uh, the the breach was August 9th, August 10th. So we were all August 10th, August 11th, not able to get into MLS. Mm -hmm. So our leadership nearly immediately met and considered 
you know, the options are bad. We don't know what's what's going on with Rappertoni, when they're going to be back. And Perchwell had been looking to, to open for quite some time. So they made a decision. And within about a week or so after the outage, they decided uh, Perchwell was not necessarily all the way ready, but was believed to be close enough that we would start that transition. Uh, so that turn was made here, uh, which is different. I think every other Rapitoni MLS in the country is now functioning and working. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll just say that the, and in fact, that's just an important point. Everybody was well-intended in the decisions that were made. Uh, our, our local board is led by uh, elected uh, directors. Uh, they are all volunteers. Uh, appraisers and others are involved in, in MLS uh, and other um, uh, components of, of contributing to the board, all volunteers. And there's a paid professional staff. In nowhere in that list of people would you find somebody who wanted things not to go well. Right. With that said, there's a but coming up, Hal. The but is... <laughs> It was a colossal failure. Uh, Perchwell was less ready than I think everybody thought. Uh, the data integrity was a big problem. We were we were having things go into wrong areas, wrong school districts. You know, the ability to get it right was not ready, and uh, the the search functions were not ready on the valuation side, uh, and it, it put us in a position where we were scrambling. Um, hmm. And to phase the leadership part of this in with the local appraisers, Hal, in 2022, when this was going to become available in three months. In the fall of 2022, uh, we called a meeting with local appraisers at the board office, had a, a, a kind person zoom in from Perchwell and walk us through the, the little bit of an introduction. And no valuation functions were working properly at that point. So appraisers left that meeting very frustrated, some very angry, um, and we began to collect information from that group of appraisers saying, okay, this is not ready to go, but we need to communicate. What can we put together for them? So we created, with assistance from that group, an extensive outline of valuation functions that needed to be working uh, for us to be able to do our job. We provided that initially in the fall of 2022, updated it in December of 2022. Uh, myself, Ernie Durbin, you probably know several local appraisers were on the testing committee earlier this year. None of those items were functional yet. Um, so uh, fast forward to uh, turning this on. That was leadership provided then. They turned this on. We still can't do any of those, those functions. Um, so it was a, a big crisis on our end. Uh, and on the agent side, they had our same frustration. They use reports and valuation tools as well. Uh, but they also were having trouble with the clunky system in terms of inputting data. Uh, and we all began to realize rather quickly that the data integrity was a was a, a big, big problem with things being where they belong to be. So I'll repeat that I don't hold anybody accountable. I don't I don't have an issue with the agents who are angry. I don't have an issue with the leadership that thought they were doing the right thing. But we arrived at a point uh, that I'm referring to as the information crisis. Um, and it was so intense that there's a lot of anger floating around. Um, yeah. I want to point out the appraisal leadership things that we did along the way to try to help through this. Uh, immediately after the outage, uh, we uh, called a meeting with RPR, appraiser still meeting about RPR. We brought an RPR trainer in. Um, she was Janelle, don't remember her last name, but she was wonderfully helpful. Uh, we did an hour uh, with her uh, on Zoom in the classroom at the local board offices. We recorded that and then we sent that out uh, via OCAP uh, to the entire state because there were things in RPR that are helpful. And most of us mm -hmm. are so accustomed to working in MLS that we thought it was valuable to send that out to not just the Cincinnati appraisers who are in this information situation, uh, but to all of Ohio. It does search public record. It does some trending. And there were some things in there that, uh, that uh, were valuable tools. So that was chapter one in trying to deal with the crisis. Uh, unknown at that point uh, how much was ahead of us. We were assuming that you know, we would have better information in the short run. So for those that don't know what RPR is, tell, tell us briefly what that is. That's real property resources. It's it's a, a, a database created by NAR. So it has a lot of information uh, and uh, it does uh, searches for sales. It does it has a, a sales comparison approach component um, and it has some trending information. I found the trending information is much better by a zip code than by a local area name. So it's large area information. It's not going to whittle you down to your sub market and maybe the things that affect whether you need to make a data sale adjustment. But in the absence of being able to do that effectively in Rapitoni, it's one of the few tools we have available to support our, our observations on trending. Um, so it's, it's been an, a, a good addition to the data sources. Yeah, and it's it, all along, um, we have Candy Cook that works with us here at Appraisory Learning, and she's been a big proponent of appraisers checking out RPR. 
And the reason is, it's just another source of data and it's another way to look at things. And I think it's a really useful tool. It's got some robust functionality, um, but it is not on its own a standalone end all be all for appraisers. So let's do this. I'm going to take a real quick break and hear from uh, another commercial sponsor and then we'll come back and wrap this up. Since 1978, LIA Administrators and Insurance Services has been offering E&O insurance to valuation professionals. LIA applies superior customer service, exceptional liability education from Peter Christensen, and unparalleled claim defense managed by Claudia Gaglioni. LIA offers errors and omissions, commercial bonds, general liability, cyber liability, and real estate agents and brokers E&O. Visit liability.com or call 800-334-0652. Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to The Appraisal Buzz. I'm Hal Humphreys. I have Steve Pappen with me today. We're talking about the Rapatoni hack um, and what it meant for appraisers kind of across the country, but specifically for Steve's situation, Cincinnati, Ohio, and, and the impact that they dealt with there. Um so let me ask you this, Steve, are you guys able to do the work of an appraiser right now? Here's how we've we've tried to guide the local appraisers at this point. And I'm going to give you another but here in just a minute. Uh, but it, it, the decision is a combination of continuity of business. Right. We have a responsibility to try to keep the real estate market moving forward and credibility. Right. Mm -hmm. So if I were to say to you, how uh, how much information do you have to have uh, to develop a credible opinion of value? I would say um, I need to collect, verify and analyze all information necessary for credible assignment results. I think what you're asking is, what does it take to make something credible? Um, and look, let's let's just be honest here. When I started appraising back in 1990, we didn't have these robust MLS systems. And there was a lot of time spent down at the courthouse actually researching sales, going through files and doing that business. That's still available. It is. The, the key word that I have shared with my peers is enough. Uh, when you have, if you go back in our appraisal careers, uh, long before we were, were doing reports as extensive as they are now, my original mentor said, when you know what the house is worth, get that report off your desk, right? Well, we're not there anymore. The world has changed, uh, but you still sometimes have a value when you don't know everything there might be to know. You, I think every appraiser has had this experience where you run a search in your favorite MLS and you're pondering why you didn't find the results you want and you re-ask the question or you pick it up the next day and lo and behold other data shows up. No MLS system is perfect. None of our search systems are perfect. So what we've counseled appraisers on uh, is, is if you don't have enough, if you cannot feel confident and incredible assignment results, it's time to stop on that particular assignment. But there should be a lot of assignments uh, where um, you have enough to be confident that your value is supported by data. Uh, maybe there's something that happened yesterday that you would have found under different circumstances. Uh, but I'm going to complicate this issue for you. Uh, the agents that were very frustrated with um, uh, the perch well, and it was a lot. Um, the um, And again, it's very valid. I have no criticism of those agents they're you know they're trying to make a living and the system has not uh, functioned to to the degree that they could they could comfortably comfortably make a living but they uh, attempted and have successfully overrode uh, the leadership of the real estate Real, Real Estate Alliance of Greater Cincinnati um, by putting a referendum up. They had over 10% of the populace uh, sign a referendum that they wanted to put this to a vote. Um, so we've had a very intense chapter here over the last couple of weeks while this was evolving. And the perch took place, the vote took place over the last couple of days. One option was to use the two systems side by side as a temporary solution. And the other option was to revert back to Rapitoni only. Uh, in the promotions of this vote, uh, the board was clearly in their communications uh, supporting the, the hybrid system, which would get us back in business the quickest. But the anger over Perchwell, the frustration over Perchwell was big. And the other component was let's just go back to Rapitoni. The vote was overwhelming to go back to Rapitoni. But here's my butt on the credibility issue. I'm going to read this to you. Um, timeline for restoring um, Rapitoni, eight weeks minimum, 
we're already seven weeks out of date. The last upload to Rapatoni with our data was August 6th, eight weeks minimum per the combined timeframes provided by Rapatoni uh, and other integration integration partners. So we now have another leadership thing to take on in Cincinnati. Um, how we need to figure out is this literally mean we're not going to have a fresh update of comparable sales for another eight weeks? Because credibility begins to change as more time passes. How can mm -hmm. I determine market conditions in November based on data available in August? Uh, so we, we have yet another chapter facing us. Uh, but I, I do want to, I know you're going to have to wrap up, but the, um, I want to tip my hat to some of the local guys that have been heavily in, involved in this. Uh, and these are very, very experienced appraisers. I think a lot of your listeners know Ernie Durbin because of his national yep. profile. Yep. Um, and he's been heavily involved in all of this. There's a guy named Rick Hamilton. And um, you know, Rick's background is uh, impressive. He was a stat wing consultant when that software was written. He was uh, helped to write Comp Cruncher for Jeff Bradford. I mean, he's, this is not a, a minor guy. And he's been in the background with Perchwell trying to, to move this along and, and other very experienced appraisers that have had uh, an impact. Uh, and I say that because I would like every, you know, the coalition leadership meeting, um, a topic I didn't really get a chance to get into is what is your coalition about today, right? We were formed in 2009, uh, mm -hmm. the Ohio Coalition. Uh, and uh, we, there was a lot going on. We had, you know, a lot of frustration with AMC. AMC law was developing. We had robust membership back in those days because we, we, we had an agenda, we were working on things. Well, staying involved with your local board, being on MLS committees to impact these decisions. We have multiple appraisers that sat in on the meetings that led up to virtual being selected, affecting the outcome, working now on training as this new system was in theory coming on board and we needed to guide them through how to set it up. Uh, those are all real critical elements of, of playing an important role uh, in your local market. If there's a coalition in, in your state, those are the kind of things you wanna be ready to respond to. Appraisers really look to either natural leaders or leadership organizations uh, when they're faced with tough times for guidance as to what to do. Yeah, and you know, the unfortunate thing for Cincinnati is, and, and it sounds like, you know, it's obviously sometimes the absolute best leadership in the world can't overcome a problem because it's just, it, it, it's, it's just a difficult problem to overcome. Correct. Um, so, you know, it, it sounds like you've got engaged, um, thoughtful, I know Ernie Durbin to be a methodical almost to the level of nerd level methodical appraiser. That would be um, my friend Ernie. And I say that with all the love in the world. I, I, right. I really do um, respect Ernie. Um, but, you know, those guys weren't going about this trying to, to get a quick fix. They were going about it trying to get the right fix. Um, and look, agents use this data all the time. Like you said, real estate appraisers in Tennessee and most of the places across the country, if you're a member of the MLS, you are a realtor. That's correct. So, so, so as a realtor, don't think of your, there's this, there's this ongoing struggle between appraisers and agents and, you know, get involved with the agent side, do some outreach with them, get on your local, um, MLS board, get involved with the local realtors organizations. We all play in the same sandbox. We need to get along and, and, and do things together. Um, you know, what is the thought process right now for you guys in Cincinnati for dealing with, you know, this is, is going to be a combination of RPR available public records and whatever Rapitoni has coming into the system over the next eight weeks. I'm not sure yet. That's something is this <laughs> referendum was just resolved today. Uh, so over the past seven weeks, we have been working in multiple data sources to try to find adequate information, right? So you've got Rapitoni up to August 6th, a familiar, usable data source for us. Uh, Perchwell, an evolving data source, is populated with some recent information, but it's not reliably consistent yet. And then RPR, which populates from these other sources, right? So it all works hand in hand. So the appraisers locally here uh, would express a loud frustration given the opportunity to the time we're putting into an assignment without a single reliable data source to be efficient 
in our work. As we go forward, what we need to figure out um, as appraisers is where are we going to find data for the next eight weeks? Will it be consistently uploaded in Perchwell? Is that our best option? Is it going to flow through to RPR? So we have that data that's MLS based data that we can search in there. Um, and will there be, as they populate Rapitoni, one of the questions I think we must ask appraisers, that is, is if that's going to be there before the, the entire 100% correction is made, will appraisers have access to that data? Um, this is, um, you know, I don't know if you got Phil Crawford's uh, podcast on this, but he was very adamant that without current data, we can't be credible. Well, I prefer the word enough, but the more time that passes and the less information we have, uh, the bigger issue that's going to be become here. And if we really are going to be another eight weeks before we can search for recent comparables, if that's the result, then there's going to be problems in this market that are maybe bigger than I think anybody anticipated approaching this vote. It's my hope that these data sources are going to be populated and we can learn you know, how to access that information uh, to be uh, to be reasonably current. Um, there's a lot of changes that have to be made and working in virtual has limitations. Um, I don't want to, you know, belabor this point, but we can't even do routine statistics in there at this point. They're all in evolution, uh, but they're not there. I can't do an average. I can do a price range in a, a community. Um, I can't run statistics to say, though, the average sale price changed 9% over the last year or, or, you know, this percent over the last few months. So, so there's a lot of challenges that we're going to continue to be faced with. And it's a difficult combination of continuity of business uh, with doing our job properly. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. You know, one of the things to come out of the, the, the Rapatoni situation that I was absolutely thrilled with, um, you know, you, you go on Facebook and hear appraisers, you know, very upset about whatever topic is being discussed. Um, I, was, I was absolutely pleased with the overwhelming response from across the country, from appraisers that were in markets that were not impacted saying, oh my gosh, Mm -hmm. and understanding what a huge deal this is. Um, and then, you know, in some markets, I, I, you know, agents and appraisers came together and, and worked on solutions. I know that some agents were like adjoining MLS systems, were taking information from agents and putting it in their MLS system so that it would at least get to um, the RPR database through mm -hmm. another MLS system. Um, just the way that, people across the industry came together to try and find solutions was really uplifting. And I, it's, a, it's a rare situation in the appraisal world. Well, I will cycle that point back to your, your comments uh, about the summit and, and your recent podcast, the camaraderie that you develop if you spend time with your peers. Uh, I helped to found OCAP in 2009. I was active, I've been actively involved in leadership and meeting uh, stuff since uh, 2004 or five. Um, and my favorite part of that entire experience uh, is the friends I've made, the camaraderie, the peers that I can share with. I can talk to people literally in different parts of the country if I need to about appraisal problem solving. Uh, you build if you become active in your local coalition or pull together guys to have lunch every once in a while, you start to build those friendships. And Al, I know you agree with me on this. Our profession is populated with a lot of great people. <clears throat> Getting to know them is really valuable. It is really valuable. It can be difficult. Um, you know, I'm thinking of my brother-in-law. Brother-in-law is an appraiser in a small town here in West Tennessee, and there aren't that many appraisers down there. Um, period. Uh, he just, he lives in a market. That there's very few appraisers, but what they do is they gather as a, a small regional group of appraisers, um, on a quarterly basis and talk about what's going on doing this stuff. If you have a chance, and I know over the past several episodes of, of the Buzzcast, we have kind of harped on this, but if you're an appraiser out there in the world and you're not a member of your local coalition, join it, get involved. If you're not a member of the national association of appraisers, join them, get involved. That, that ability to network with your peers and problem solve and help each other out in times of information crisis or whatever the issue is, is invaluable. Um, Steve, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to be here today. Uh, it was awful good to see you in Las Vegas a couple of weeks ago. Um, the summit is, I'm, I'm just, I'm impressed with the NA and how they do that. And, and I'm happy to be a part of it with appraisory learning. Um, but thank you for being here today, Steve. Thanks for having me and uh, good to talk to you guys. Thanks. Let me get, um, let me get Jim back in here. Jim Morrison, do we by chance have an anonymous appraiser question? Yeah, Steve, before we let you go, we have our anonymous appraiser section. This is uh, where our listeners 
reach out to us with questions they may have at comments at appraisalbuzz.com or the comments on our YouTube. Um, but this one was uh, posted on one of their forums. And so th this is in reference to some of the subjective talk that we've had on this Buzzcast. Um, so they had posted an image of a, a, a map, a Google map that had some of the religious uh, locations near. And they wanted to know, do they need to be redacting the word church every time it shows up if they're not supposed to be using it in their appraisal? Well, I can give you my answer. Uh, I've been appraising since the 70s, right? Things are, are different. And what I say to my peers about this is it's not five years ago. It's not 10 years ago. It's not 30 years ago. It's today. And today, if I were putting that map in, I would take my little blurring function uh, and blur out anything that could be offensive. While appraisers, by and large, feel these situations are exaggerated, they're very real in the world we're in today. Uh, so whether it is agreeable or, or pleasant in the mindset of, of us, the individual appraisers out here, taking caution uh, to make sure that you're, you're not putting something in there that you may think is no big deal at all, but could be offensive to someone else, could affect the mindset of somebody reading your report, could affect the mindset of an underwriter, step back uh, and, and just put as little of that as you can possibly control into reports and talk about the facts of, of that community, whatever, whatever you've defined as the market. Fannie and Freddie seem to like the word market now rather than neighborhood. Uh, traditional appraisal education focuses on neighborhood, but your description should be factual and it should stay away from any of the protected items in religion, it, like it or not, is a part of that. And I have absolutely nothing to add to that. Perfect answer, Steve. Um, uh, you know, here's the thing. We go back to, we are analysts. We deal in facts, uh, we gather information, we report that information. Um, there's no reason to be using subjective information or subjective commentary in your reports. Um, instead of saying, you know, superior or inferior, just highlight the differences, why this would be superior and why this would be inferior. You don't have to use the words. Um, and as far as the map goes, um, I get it. I totally get it. Don't use that map. Find another map. Um, blur it out if you have to. And that's that's my not saying another thing. <laughs> Jim, do we have anything else we need to cover today? No, I think this has been an absolutely great episode. Thanks so much, Steve, for joining us. Thank you, guys. Steve, thank you. Um, and if that's it, um, for Jim Morrison and Steve Pappen, I'm Hal Humphreys, and that is your appraisal buzzcast for this week. Mm -hmm.